Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I have to say that uh, after Pinar uh, and Lisa presentation, speaking again about art feels maybe a bit unnecessary or awkward, but nevertheless, we are in art context and this is what many of us do, so I will try. Um, I would like to start um, with, uh, I'll, I'll shortly present a, a recent research I did on, on different iterations of boycott in contemporary art, the wave of boycott, but before that, I will start with uh, with that slide. It's it, it's a situation from a performance I curated ten years ago in uh, in a Warsaw theater, where two uh, performer Senja Główny, it's a group of performers uh, that I invited to to interact with the ongoing play. So there was a situation of a regular repertoire play in the theater like that, and they uh, asked the audience to to interfere in the way they wish with this ongoing play. It was with the consent of the director and the actors. So what happened very fast was that the audience realized its dream of killing the play. You know, very often maybe you know that feeling. You sit in the theater and somehow when an actor forgets a role, you feel very excited, maybe more excited by, than by the performance. And the audience actually killed the play, chased the actors, and half of the people from the audience went on the stage. So you, here you see a moment where uh, like 50 or more people are on the stage and they, they feel satisfied with that, but then after five minutes, out of the sudden they realize that what's next? You know, there is nothing to do. The actors went away and everything that was there was the audience, one part of the audience looking at the other part of the audience and looking back and saying, there is, you know, there is no plan what to do next. And very often, maybe in art, we have this critical impulse and then we, we need a plan that follows. And uh, I will jump uh, to, the, to this research uh, because boycotts are actually those instances which do have a plan, in a way, you could say. And what we could observe in recent years, and particularly throughout 2014, was that uh, out of the sudden boycotts started to pop out uh, within the contemporary art. And uh, there are particularly four examples. So this is, uh, sorry, the previous slide was, it's a book that uh, I'm soon releasing to the, together with the students from the Summer Academy of Fine Arts in, in Salzburg. We have looked at four different, uh, four different uh, boycotts and their nature. I will try to uh, shortly go through them and see if there is a relation also with the real protest or political movement. So first of, of them is Manifesta. It's actually linked with my own experience being a curator of public program there uh, of uh, finding yourself in Russia during annexation of Crimea. And then the, the, the boycott appeared. That was a kind of a boycott from outside calling for uh, cancelling of Manifesta as a, in solidarity uh, with uh, mm, criticizing Russia for annexing uh, Crimea. And as a curator, I, I was in this situation where I agreed with the... With the um, you know what was what boycotters were calling for, and yet I was inside and didn't feel I have to leave immediately. So dilemma of engagement and disengagement was was very very leading uh, to that context. But at the end, um, what uh, I have tried to address was that okay, in that situation, the, the art exhibition should go on, but it cannot go undisturbed. In other words, you cannot pretend nothing has happened. You know, it's important to embrace the political situation. Another example is the 13 Istanbul Biennial. Uh, in 2013, um, where the biennial became also a target of, of boycotters, and actually uh, because of the gentrification processes, but also the biennial coincided with the Gezi uh, Park protests, and as a result, um, uh, as a result, the public program was uh, in the public space was cancelled. Uh, and uh, the curators, uh, you know, said that not, art cannot compete, of course, with what what is happening in the in the public realm. Uh, therefore, uh, it has to go inside, and artists can engage as as citizens. Uh, and there was a very big debate uh, around that. Then came Biennale of Sydney, actually at the same moment, almost in March 2014, where a chairman of the board uh, turned out to be involved in the Transfield, a company which is also sponsoring offshore detention centers. What is interesting is that this biennial was founded by that company back in 1976, but it was only in 2014 that out of the sudden this claim was heard, as if you know certain conditions came for this claim to be heard. And what is also interesting about this boycott is it was organized by the artist within the biennial. So not, not only calling from outside, but actually the, the artist who who challenged and said that they will not go on and they will stop the exhibition if, if something doesn't change. And at the end of it, actually, the, the chairman resigned. Uh, so in, in, a, 
in a, it was um, tokenistic victory, but still within the biennial it was a victory. But of course, it doesn't uh, it didn't influence the politics of uh, of the detention center and the Australian uh, government. And then finally, the San Paulo biennial that uh, Jonas was also part of it was also uh, boycotted uh, or not well. There was a threat of boycott. There was a a proposition of withdrawal uh, in solidarity with uh, Gaza, um, uh, I mean, the moment of a Gaza war in 2014, uh, where uh, the board of the biennial completely ignored uh, the fact of Israeli founding and which kind of repercussions it can have for the common, um, uh, also for the, for, for the uh, Palestinian and uh, artists from the Middle East within the biennial. And what was also important with that biennial um, is uh, that the curator sided with the artist against the board, so that somehow the protest happened inside. And a few points that I, I have thought uh, in terms of in, in the synchronicities of art bo boycott, you know, that David Beach, uh, an English scholar, he actually goes as far as saying that those boycotts happened in 2014 because they were like echoing the Occupy movement. That, of course, Occ there is a moment when Occupy happened, but then throughout the years, and we do it maybe today here too, that we are um, like going through the effects of Occupy. We are intellectually absorbing it. Uh, through practice, we are absorbing it. And maybe that was the way that art also somehow, um, uh, you know, um, yeah, put into, put, put into its uh, reflection in terms of withdrawals and boycott the, the whole Occupy uh, phenomenon. Um, also, uh, there is, of course, the whole history of art boycott that can go back to the art strike, to the concept of withdrawal. Uh, but what is also interesting that almost none or none of those boycotts that I mentioned is re it's connected with the real political movement. It's purely symbolic. So in a way, it's like art. And this makes it, of course, very short-lived and very momentous. They, of course, do have a whistleblowing uh, character. They have a character of paresia, of, of, to use the Foucaultian term, to, to speak truth to power that we also mentioned here today. Um, they do have uh, uh, hidden agendas, so uh, of course, you know, they, they go against, uh, they reveal the, the uh, sponsorship, the PR strategies. Uh, maybe they are also, some argue, against the rise of curators. Um, and uh, what, is, what I would like maybe to end up with is that uh, an argument of Tirdar Zolheit, uh, a curator who was also reflecting on the boycotts, that maybe when we look, look a little bit in larger forms at the art boycott, it's not uh, that they are there. One thing is to support and to be in the solidarity with the real movement, but the other thing is maybe they are in, in the sense of intuition for art to make art differently, to make a st step from only being critical to being also proactive. So in other words, if the audience would come again on the stage, that there is not this feeling of confusion that we killed the show, but that we know also where we go next. So thank you.